Good morning, everybody. Good morning. I'll have to go over here so you can see. Is this good? Yeah. Okay, cool. Good morning. Um, my name is Holly Combs, and I'm the executive director of the Department of Public Words. Everyone say with me, words. Words. Right, because I'll have this conversation with someone, and they're like, ask me about like the bridge infrastructure problems and the potholes, and I get nasty calls. And honestly, I want you to say it again with me, Department of Public Words. Department of Public Words. Boom. You got it. Good job. Good morning. <laughs> All right, so we are the Department of Public Words, and that means that we celebrate words through our work. We think that words have an immense amount of power. Words change people's lives. Words in public spaces can change people's lives and you never even hear about it. And that's how our murals work. So we, the founders, we started this whole nonprofit because we love people. So we started this whole organization because we love people. Our mission is positive words empowering people through art and education. So what that looks like, we will show you. So I've got Megan here and Dave. Say hi, Megan and Dave. Hi. They're each going to be coming up here with me, and I'm going to be talking with them about the roles they have in our organization. And it's really amazing work, and I'm excited to tell you about it. The first thing I want to get out of the way is you probably met us. <laughs> yes? How many people have seen this in Fountain Square? See, you've already met us. We're already friends. I'm so excited. So what does this say? What does this mural say? I'm going to count to three and everybody say it together. If you don't say it with power, I'm going to have you say it again, all right? I'm going to count to three. One, two, three. You are beautiful. Gosh, thanks. It's so nice to hear, and I want you guys to know that you are beautiful. And we put this up eight years ago on the top of the Murphy Art Center. We put it up there because actually we ourselves needed to hear it. And we were very inspired by Matthew Hoffman, who started the You Are Beautiful 10 years ago. These three words can change a person's life. They seriously can be crossing a street, stop, dead in their tracks, stop scrolling on their phone and go. Seriously, like, we're superheroes. We can make buildings talk. And that's pretty powerful, don't you think? Now, this has hung out there for a very long time, and we're so happy to celebrate that about a year ago, we we put up metal letters, so it will be up forever. And um, for your children, 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 children. And I'm very excited that it'll be there. And if we're not here, please tell them to keep that up there and restore it and happy, all right? All right. This is a drawing that um, Dave drew. Um, I was talking to him about how creative teams look. Now, anybody in here in a creative team? Cool, anybody just in a team all together? It's exactly the same. Yeah. <laughs> right, because you're already identifying this guy right here, right? You're like, yeah, I got that guy on my team. <laughs> You'd name him right now, somebody call him out. It's okay, call it out. Him or her, paint the blue in the wrong spot. <laughs> Who is it? That person. So that's why we put that on there. This is our creative team. But the reason I wanted to show this is because our team at the Department of Public Words depends on each other. Now, not none of us have similar skills, and what a great thing that is. See, together we are better, right? Can we say together, better together? Better together. No one can do anything on their own. We don't have the skill set to create on our own. It doesn't work. What we make doesn't look like community. It looks like maybe something we have in our head. And this is really essential to who we are. So Megan is our grants director slash community uh, community mural coordinator, and Dave, he can do anything. <laughs> so Dave actually is our programs director, all around does everything. Um, you might see that I, I'm fond of this guy. Actually, we've been married for 15 years. Oh. Woo! Yeah. <laughs> um, that's kind of a big deal to me because I think that's super dang impressive. Um, I love this guy so much, and I get to work with him every day. We have two kids. You guys stand up to me. They're so beautiful. Oh, say hi, Alden. This guy. I'm just getting all this business out of the way. I also have four four very important people here on the front row. Can you guys stand for your This is my parents and Dave's parents. <laughs> the reason they're so important is because they believed in us. And do you know that that's very important? Just anyone that will believe in you. Also, this beautiful lady in yellow, it's her birthday. Can you guys say happy birthday? Happy birthday! I love it. Thank you. Happy birthday. 
All right, so moving along. Um, I just want to uh, grab you right away with something that helps really describe what we do. This is Alden. Um, you guys just met him. He's 10 years old. Hi, Alden. Um, uh, when he was six years old, he interrupted me while I was cooking. And if you know me, you know not to do that. <laughs> Except he said this. Hey, Mom. 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 I'm like, 14, 15, 16. How many is he going to go, right? And then I'm like, okay, this seems important. Nobody's bleeding, but okay. So I turn the stove off. And I squat down and I say, what's up? What is so important? Right, because I'm going to burn things if I don't hear this. And he said, you know what, Mom? I don't think that people hear the words, I love you enough. Drop them. <laughs> Dang, I'm glad I turned the stove off, right? I said, baby, what do you want to do about it? He's six, right? He's observing some really bad thing in our culture that we are not kind and say I love you enough. Like, why are we scared to say this? I just want to say right now that I love each and every one of you with all my heart. And I know you don't hear it enough. So just know somewhere out there, this little guy right here, all of us here at the Department of Public Words love you. So I uh, needed to finish dinner. And he said, you know, go talk to your dad. <laughs> So we went upstairs, talked with Dave, and he wrote, I love you on a piece of paper, and we printed 2,000 stickers, like $46. And over the past four years, he's handed out these stickers to total strangers. Burger King, Starbucks, gas station, grown ass men crying. <laughs> it's a beautiful thing. <laughs> He's got kisses from total strangers. And yes, I encourage my children to talk to strangers. Why are we so scared? You can change the world with one small idea. You can. All of them did. You can. I don't care how simple it is. Just be brave. Take a risk. Walk up to somebody and encourage them. Because you know everybody's looking sad. If you can see their face, they're all different. tangent out of the way. I am an artist. How many artists we got up here? You may not think you are. Like, everybody, go ahead. <laughs> this is a really big problem. This is an epidemic in our society, and here's the deal. If you accept exposure bucks, this is the last day that's going to happen. Do you know what I'm talking about, exposure bucks? Raise your hand. We've all done it. Stop it. I'm serious. You are valuable. I have a sign. That's what I do, I make some of <laughs> Stop taking exposure bucks right now. Be empowered. Charge well for your work, because when I charge a lot for it, and they can go find you, and you charge a little, <clears throat> <laughs> that's all I got. Seriously, please, please, know your worth. Charge well. Charge a lot. You create magic. What price can you put on that? You got it? That was my serious mom face. Okay. That. Say it with me. Say, I am valuable. I am valuable. I don't even believe you. Say it one more time. I am valuable. Good. Okay. Know that. Now, I'd like to explain to you how all this began. Like, how do, how do like, three people start a nonprofit with the purpose of encouraging people for a living? How do you, like, wake up and get there? I'll tell you. I drew this on my big post-it on my desk. It starts with two people who get married who are artists. And we're like, dang, our skill sets together, we could do anything. What is it we want to do? What is it we should be doing? So of course then we, we started a movement to ban the typeface Comic Sans. <laughs> Woo! Thank you, thank you, thank you, over here. Um, yeah, does anyone here like Comic Sans? It's okay, people. <laughs> Middle school girl. <laughs> Are you with me? Okay. Anyone hate it? Woo! Okay. We're actually the people that started the movement to ban Comic Sans. You are meeting them in real life. It's kind of exciting. Actually, we've become way more famous for this than all of our much more successful projects. How weird is that? That's so funny. Anyway, so we tried to ban the typeface Comic Sans, and this, this actually drew us together as a married couple. I, would, I said, I have to use it for this big museum in Indianapolis, the whole gallery guide, and I said, why don't we ban it? And I was like, why don't we get married? <laughs> He's a genius, I told you. I told you. 
<laughs> All right, after that, we actually started noticing, because we were putting banned Comic Sans stickers on the offenses in public. You know, you see it, like, for your, like, pediatrician. Taking new patients, really? Are you kidding? That's no funny. So we put a sticker on there, and the next week, they replaced the sign with Helvetica. Yeah! <laughs> Words have power. All right, so after that, after stickering things, we found out there's this whole movement of stickers, and we actually started a magazine called Peel Magazine, and it celebrated stickers all over the world, and we started celebrating art in public spaces and how much power art in public spaces have. And then we had a book called Peel Magazine, and magazine and it got really big, and it ate us like a monster in 2008 when the economy, you know how that goes, 2008? Anybody around when things just, in 2008? Okay, good, you know. So after that, we kind of like, um, we stumbled around. That's this area here. We stumbled around, like, what do you do when, when it didn't work? And as creatives, we take risks, and sometimes things, they go as far as they can go, and then they end. And that's okay, but then what do you do next? Well, at this point, we had two children, and they're pretty awesome. And um, this was about three years ago. Dave and I, laying in bed, I said, you know what I've realized in parenting is that the kids don't do what we say, they do what we do. That's troubling. That means we have to like behave really well, like a lot. <laughs> so I said, Dave, what if we just like started a nonprofit and just like encourage people every day? Because I can tell that that is actually going to have a lot of impact on the world, and we have serious job security because people need encouragement always. And I'm all about job security, right? We actually pitched this idea to uh, CNC at Brian Payton. Anybody know I'm super cool? We're like, we'd like to encourage people for a living. He's like, that sounds like a great idea. We're like, I know. And Dave's like, we could call it the Department of Public Words. He's like, that's clever. <laughs> so from there, three years ago, we began thinking about how is it we can use words to empower people through art and education. And right when we started this, this lovely lady walked up to me, Megan, and she's like, you know, I worked in a nonprofit that did art, and I like can help with grants, and like I can pretty much help with anything, and I'm an amazing painter. Well, she didn't say that, but she's an amazing painter, and um, she could help with our community crowd murals. And I'm like, there's the team. That's how it starts. It's a huge risk to say you are going to start a nonprofit for the purpose of encouraging people. That's a risk. That just sounds like what? Y'all hippies? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, we are. We love people deeply, and every day we want to wake up with that purpose, with a big fat smile on our face and say, that's what we do. So that's what we do. We fell in love over the mutual hatred of one man's invention. I invented the most hated and most loved font in the world. My name is Vincent Canera. I'm a typographic engineer, and I've been doing this for 26 years. I was working at Microsoft. The consumer division wanted to know what we thought about the fonts. We was in this program, which later was called Microsoft Bob. When I loaded the CD, a little dog came up, but he talked in a speech balloon like you would get in a newspaper cartoon strip. But it was in the system font Times New Roman. I thought, that's silly. Dogs don't talk like that. So I said, it would look better if it looked like a comic book. I took a look at what I saw, tried to recreate it with a mouse on a computer screen, and I quickly drew up in about three days enough letters so they could test it. When Windows 95 shipped, Thomas Sands was on every computer in the world. My name is Holly Combs. My name is Dave Combs, and we feel that Comic Sans is a blight on the landscape of typography. The problem with it is your average person is uninformed. It's tools in the hands of morons. Comic Sans looks like someone threw up on the keyboard and that's what came out. Comic Sans is an epidemic. It is worthy of banning. Boom. Dave and I met in 2000 and I worked with a client and they told me, you have to do an entire gallery guide in Comic Sans. Holly tells me and I say, why don't we just ban it? Let's make a campaign to ban Comic Sans. And I looked at him and I was like, do you want to get married? So <laughs> we did. Dave sat down right away and was like, well, we could make a website. And I was like, again, maybe we should have children. Like, we should do this thing. 
Dave and Holly Combs were probably the first to write to me and say, we're thinking of doing something and we're going to call it Band Comic Sans. I didn't think a lot about it, so I said, well, knock yourself out. Band Comic Sans is a campaign to eradicate the misuse of the font Comic Sans. We wanted people to start talking about fonts and how they use them, and when they use them inappropriately, we wanted to call it out. It's all over the world. It's like creeped into the souls of everyone. You can't go anywhere without seeing Comic Sans. We're right now in the south of France, the only restaurant in town. The entire dessert menu is in Comic Sans. Their opening hours are in Comic Sans. The sign in the toilet is in Comic Sans. You'll see a sign that says wet paint. Are they just kidding? Is it a joke? Do you know do what they... people do when they see that? They, they touch it. <laughs> the Vatican used it on a photo album. There's a law firm, I believe it's a law firm, that has big, bright Comic Sans on the front of their building. And did you hear that he said, I believe it's a law firm? Because why would you think it's a law firm if the name of the law firm is in Comic Sans? Like, really? You're gonna help me with my case? That's freaking magic right there, man. There's a lot of cool stuff online about Comic Sans. It's definitely reached like a, a cultural kind of uh, crescendo, I guess you would say. Comic Sans is the best ones in the world. If you want your designs to look like they're done by little girls. Not so fast, Ransom. Comic Sans! Comic Sans best used in moderation. I don't have an answer. It's just everywhere. I love how Vincent Conar put it. He said, if you love it, you don't know much about typography. And if you hate Comic Sans, you don't know anything about typography either, and you should get another hobby. Little jab to us there, I think, but it's perfect. People don't always listen to the best music and don't always wear the best clothes and don't always have the best haircut. But that doesn't mean that everything they do and everything they choose is wrong. I think he realizes he wouldn't be as famous for making the font if it weren't for our efforts to ban it. Without Comic Sans, they probably wouldn't have ever gotten together as a couple. So I think I was, I'm was i quite proud of that. Comic Sans should never be used, ever. If you like Comic Sans, just use it. It's there to be used and enjoyed. Comic Sans is the best font in the world. If you want your designs to look like they're done by little girl. I've always wanted to show that with a group of people that would it, so thank you. <laughs> it's like a dream come true. Okay, awesome. So I'm going to get out of the way here. Um, on the stage now is Megan. Say hi, Megan. Hi, Megan. I, I like the back of her uh, jacket. Can you see? It says, what? What does it say? Happy oh. See? She's perfect. All right. All right. So we're going to talk about our current community murals right now. We're going to stroll through some of them that actually we um, did last year. And um, so um, I'm going to grab this mic from Megan. We're going to knock through this. Does anyone know what time it is? I, I'm pretty good at time estimates. But... OK, we got this. All right, cool. So community notes. This is Megan. I'm going to let her talk about these pictures because I think they're pretty rad. <laughs> so this is big way back. And um, we decided to start with the story of how I became an artist. And that story starts in school, for me, I was um, good at school. I excelled at school. It was something that came easy for me because memorizing things are easy for me, and so test taking was easy for me. I absorbed the message that people who are good in school either go to school to become a doctor or a lawyer. I thought that the doctor side sounded more interesting, so that was, that was the path that I chose as I went into college. And as I was sitting in this large lecture hall, hearing about all of the classes that I would have to take as a pre-med major, I started thinking, I can't do this. My eyes get droopy when I hear about all the ologies and chemistry classes that I would be happy to take. And I turned to my mom and I said, Mom, I do not want to do this. And she said, what? What do you want to do? And I said, I want to be an art major. And lucky for me, my mom has always been super supportive, and she said, well, let's go find the art building. So we got up and bounded down the stairs and got out of there and actually found the art building, and I um, became an art major 
This is my husband and I. We moved to this city 13 years ago, and we've been living and working as artists for the past 13 years. The picture on the right is me signing the very first painting I ever sold. So I know this um, quote is very important to Megan, and she wants to share it with you because this is an aspect of risk and knowing your worth. Um, you have to address those topics. I felt as I decided to be an artist, it was a big risk that I took, and even though there was fear involved, it took walking through that fear to really getting to who I was. Um, I'm reading Big Magic by Elizabeth Gilbert, and this, this quote, like Holly said, spoke to me. It says, fear, I recognize and respect that you are part of this family, and so I will never exclude you from our activities, but still, your suggestions will never be followed. You're allowed to have a seat, and you're allowed to have a voice, but you are not allowed to have a vote. You're not allowed to touch the roadmaps. You're not allowed to suggest detours. You're not allowed to fiddle with the temperature. Dude, you are not even allowed to touch the radio. But above all else, my dear old familiar friend, you are absolutely forbidden to drive. Yeah, right? Can we all like claim that? That's like really good. Um, that's amazing. So Megan also, on top of being incredible in the way she helps us gather funds and grants, she also herself is a very, very active artist. And um, these are some of her works. Uh, currently, I focus on landscapes, and um, it's a mix between abstract and light and color and representational images of the Midwest. Here are several examples. Actually, she's working on one right now. We're working with the uh, Mary County Juvenile Detention Center to actually celebrate their waiting area that is so bad and clinical and scary, and we're going to be putting artwork in it, so she's working on a landscape for that area right now. So these are some of her landscapes, and they, in here, you should see the colors. Oh, it's amazing. So let's talk about this amazing project. Did anyone see this coming in? You know, it's like 600 feet, it's right there. So go visit it. It's a 600-foot mural called the Love Train that we made last summer. So how did that happen? This was a giant project. Like Holly said, I encourage you to walk along the Monon Trail. It extends all the way from 52nd Street to 54th Street. And this project started when we were discussing a project in this area. The Meridian Kessler Neighborhood Association has grants available to the neighborhood. And I've lived in this neighborhood for 13 years, and I've seen these murals. They used to have different murals on each panel. And they were done over 15 years ago. They were fading. There was a clear coat on all of them that was peeling off. It was just a matter of time before all of the paint underneath that also was shedding onto the ground. And so I thought, we could probably repair those. And so we started down that path and talked to the, the building owners, and they said, actually, we have been wanting to completely redo those for years. Would you guys take on that project? And we took a big deep breath and said, sure. <laughs> and this was our first major mural project. We knew that in order to complete it, we would have to involve somebody who used stencils. We were asking the community to volunteer with us, and we connected with an artist who is a stencil expert in the region, Pete Walliger, and worked with him to come up with the design and pay homage to the, the trail that used to be a railroad. Awesome. So this project involved over 300 volunteers from the community. So a lot of ownership has happened with the community. If someone tags it, before we even notice, the community has come and and uh, gone over that. So there's a, that's what happens with our murals. There's over 270 positive messages and encouraging statements on this train. So if you're feeling down, just take a couple block walk and you are gonna feel like a rock star. So that's what our murals are. The purpose is for them is to encourage people and bring smiles to their faces. So this is a new one, yeah. This is just down the street too. If you get a chance, keep walking. And if you um, walk to 49th in the Monon, this is what we call the Harmony mural. And we started this mural again, another big blank wall with murals that were falling apart. Um, we collaborated with an artist in the, the city. Her name is Jamie Locke, and she focuses on mandala uh, works. And we wanted to invoke peace and harmony into the neighborhood. We asked the neighbors to come up with words that describe the neighborhood, and they came up with peace, vibrant, beauty, harmony. And so we put all of those messages on this mural as well. And if you'd like to see a peek on how this happens with stencils, it's pretty fascinating. We have a short video for you to see.
Yay. Isn't spray painting fun? <laughs> awesome. So, um, yeah. I love that mural, and to think you can get that much detail, right? Um, so this is another mural we worked with the Arts Council, and actually the Arts Council people came and spray painted. You've never seen happier people that have been sitting at a desk spray painting. It's like the coolest thing. So we worked on this mural. Um, Megan did a ton of research to create um, what you see now. Will you tell them a little bit what you found out? Sure. One of the things that we like to do with our murals is really respect the sense of place. And the designs can define what is the neighborhood, what the neighborhood has been, and this mural does just that. So there was a woman, her name was Pink Cathcart, and she lived on this specific corner. It's on 9th and Penn in the 1900s. And she actually wrote a book and told about Indianapolis from her perspective during that time, which is fascinating. And so we decided to pay homage to her. Um, the, the Central Library is right down the street too. And so we decided to add a book with falling words indicative of some of the things that she wrote. Yeah, I think it's pretty cool that her name's Pink, because like in her time, she was like Pink, like the singer Pink, like she's just like this really badass woman, and like we got to like pay homage to that, and she documented the changes of Indianapolis. If you can find this tiny book, it took a minute to find it. Old it's but worth it, it's worth it. Um, here's a, I don't even feel like this. Doesn't it make you feel like that? It makes me feel like that. So this is another design. So this is a design that's also right out the windows. Um, it's at the end of this block on Winthrop here. And we were approached to do a mural on this building that kept getting tagged. It's something people come to us and they say, please make this prettier because it keeps getting tagged. And the funny thing is, is that once it has a mural on it, people respect it, especially if they're people from the neighborhood who have helped create it, it instills a sense of pride. And so this is um, a visual res representation of a breath so I designed it in a way that worked with the existing vertical stripes on the building. And there's a, actually a secret message because we're the Department of Public Words and we always include words. These on either side, there are um, a set of numbers, zeros and ones, written in binary code because the building TCC that the building is on uh, is a software company. And so on one side, it says in binary code technology and on the other side, it says community. Isn't that neat? All right, so go see if you can find those, um, find those things. Can everybody say thanks, Megan? Thanks, Megan. Megan, Megan. Megan Lizzie, thanks, you. Awesome. So I love this guy <laughs> very much. Um, we work together, and he really focuses on crowd murals. And crowd murals are interesting because when we thought of the concept, I really was into this like idea when people did flash mobs. You know, you show up like at one place, you know, woo, 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 and you dance, and everyone's like, whoa, because it's like so impressive to have people all in one place unified. I just love the idea of unifying a group of people. So we thought we could do that art style, and this is um, this is called our crowd murals, and this is our second program that we're going to talk about now. Um, just so you understand who we are as people, I, I would love for Dave to share with you a little bit about how he became an artist. Okay, so um, my story is similar to Megan's. I was very good at school. Um, I was good at particularly math and science, so people kind of steered me. Guidance counselors said, you should be an engineer. You'll make a lot of money. So I said, okay, I'll give that a try. Um, although I really was an artist at heart, and I just didn't know it yet. Uh, when I went to school, when I went to engineering school, I found myself drawing a lot in class instead of taking notes, and that doesn't work out very well. <laughs> so. One of the things I drew is this uh, flyer here. I was at uh, Rose Holman, and it's a prestigious engineering college. Um, and there were all these really smart engineers there, so I thought I would have some fun with them. Um, at, on the campus, as you're walking to class, turtles would randomly walk across the, uh, the sidewalk. So I thought I'd have some fun with that. So I made these flyers, and I posted them around campus. Yeah, And um, actually, these very bright, intelligent people would, would call my number and say, I think I found your turtle. He seems to be responding to the name Roland. So, so, so I didn't have the heart to tell him it was a joke. I just said, oh, thank you so much. 
So I took the turtles and I, I let them all go eventually. But uh, that was a fun uh, project, actually. So. so this is where our social spirit experiment kind of thing birthed with him. When I met him and he told me that story, it's like, wow, you're a genius, right? And then with Band Comic Stands was next, right? So from the turtles to Band Comic Stands, it's been a pretty fun journey. We enjoy social experiments. And so the idea of like starting the Department of Public Words, it's kind of like a social experiment. It's working really well. Um, so, um, so Dave, um, there was like a voice I remember you telling me about that was earlier in your high school years. Um, can you tell about that? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> this is a uh, self-portrait that I did in high school. Um, my high school art teacher, Mr. Jones, he didn't get me until my senior year, and he, he pulled me out of class, and he said, why am I only getting you as a senior? But in high school, I took very an academic heavy course load, which didn't allow time for art classes. Um, and he, he pulled me out of class and said, what are you going to do after high school? And I said, well, I'm going to be an engineer because, you know, I'll make a lot of money, right? And he said, um, well, you can do that, but you also have the opportunity to be an artist. Um, you have enough talent and skill that if you want to become an artist, you can do that for a career. So that was really the first person that had really said that to me. And I'm very thankful for Mr. Jones. Um, and that voice came back to me after college, and I was like, yeah, maybe I could be an artist. So that's how I became an artist. So Dave took a huge risk. Um, when we got married, um, we, you know, he had a, he worked for a big company, this, you know, Fortune 500 company, and I'm like, cool, stable, yeah, right? Benefits. And benefits, health insurance, <laughs> you know, all these things. And, uh, but I could see that he wasn't happy. And when you see someone that you love dearly not happy, you have to like, you have to talk about that. So we had some hard conversations, and uh, he's like, I just really want to do art, I just really want to do art, and at this point we had had children, these beautiful kids, and they had really awakened in us. They're so awesome. Um, this love for kids, right? I didn't even know I liked kids until I had them, so thank you. Um, so, uh, yeah, so um, Dave, he, he's actually way better with kids than I am, and I was like, you know, have you ever considered teaching? So, you know, with two kids fresh born, uh, what did you do? So yeah, so I left the corporate world and I became an art teacher. Um, yeah. I worked, yeah, and it's awesome. I I love I love art. I love kids. I love working with kids to share my joy of art with them. So this is me um, working with a group of kids, um, actually at my daughter's school, and uh, I'm just teaching them how to use colored pencils. Some of these kids don't get art classes, and um, we brought art to the school. So. Awesome. Yeah, so we're going to actually jump into what some of the crowd murals and we're going to kind of scroll through those and let you see what that looks like. The next one I'm showing you is really dear to my heart. Um, my son and I have dyslexia and it's a superpower. I just don't think people know how awesome dyslexia is. Now it kind of does suck that it's hard to read, pretty much impossible to read or write or spell anything, even enough for a spell check to help. Yeah, that kind of sucks. But the superpowers that come with dyslexia I never traded in, right? So we got the opportunity to go to a camp this summer and work with 50 dyslexic students. Heck yeah, right? So we made this with them, and so tell them about it. So it was really cool. I don't have dyslexia, but when we went and talked to the kids, um, it was really powerful to be able for Holly to stand in front of them and say, I'm dyslexic and I'm successful, and you can be too. And we used art as a technique to kind of build their confidence. They came in, and I don't know if you can tell, but these are all self-portraits inside the word dyslexia. And we told the kids, you're going to be able to draw your self-portrait. And they said, no, I can't do it. And um, many of them were very fearful, scared to try something new. But by the end, they were holding up their self-portrait and saying, hey, this looks just like me. I did this. And it built their confidence. And um, then we digitally we scan in all the artwork, and then we digitally print this mural. And this lives at the Dyslexia Institute of Indiana as a reminder to the kids: you can't do it. You know. Right. So art is secondary. I've had the privilege of working with amazing organizations here, art organizations, Arts for Learning. One of them is Stephanie here. Um, I got to work with them, and I got to work with the Art Center, both Dave and I, um, and, and Art with a Heart. And art is the goal. Like art is produced, but what we realized is we really felt like art was secondary that building a kid's confidence or people's confidence in general was the primary goal of us. And then, okay, yeah, art was made. So that's kind of how it works with these crowd murals. We're gonna go through just a few more. 
Yeah, I love this one. This one's in Pulaski, Indiana. Anybody here from Pulaski? Have you ever visited? Very good. Know where it is. Okay. <laughs> anyway, it's a small town, but this this is like um, this is the whole town. I mean, the, the kids. <laughs> it's like all everybody in all the kids in the whole town go to the school. So it was like 650 kids, and um, we we worked with them to to learn how to draw their self portraits. And inside the words "You are beautiful" is their self portrait. So it's a unified message and kids owning their awesome. Boom. Right? How cool is that? The kids get to unify in a voice. Um, and you are beautiful is one of those things that a lot of people don't know that they're beautiful and so it's important to us. So this is one we did at Warren Central. Yeah, this is at Warren Central and in this one we got to teach kids the difference between a selfie and a headshot. Mm -hmm. And they had never heard of headshots, many of them. So, they were like, someone else can take my picture? <laughs> yeah, and, and so they actually set up a camera and did the photography shoot. They, um, they came up with a message, and this was their message that they wanted to share with their school. So we empowered the kids to share their own voice and encourage others to have a voice and be a voice not an echo. So just to give you a scale, this is 10 foot by 18 foot. It was big, right? So pretty awesome. Right now we're in when we're in process. So this is just um, this is going to be at all the Salvation Armies. Yeah, this was our first like crowdsourced crowd mural. We actually asked people to um, photograph with these little signs we made and hashtag them and share your YAB. And then we put them all. We're going to put them all. This is all we have done so far. But we're going to put them in um, in the Salvation Armies just like this. So it'll say you are beautiful. Pretty neat, huh? Have you guys ever seen anything like this? No? It's because it has never existed. We thought of it. It's really fun to think how, what you can think of can actually become something that is awesome. So thank you, Dave, so much. Um, can you guys say thanks, Dave? Thanks, Dave. Awesome. Alright, so um, I'm just going to run through our third um, experience that we create at the Department of Public Words. And I'm going to ask everyone to stand up, because everyone's tired, I can tell. Stretch. Yes, does anyone have any dance moves they want to show me? <laughs> I do this in the classroom, and the kids are like, oh, uh, uh. Hi, oh, good, you're stretching, that's beautiful. Okay, no dance moves, anybody? Anybody have a great one? My son has one. Do it. Okay, it looks like this. You got a cake. Everybody cake? All right. Woo! I'm trying to get your blood phone. Okay, you can sit down. All right. So, um, all right. So, three years ago when we started this, um, I had, since 2010, had the idea that I wanted to work with juvenile offenders. That really fascinates me. I'm a white girl from Avon. I don't know much about, much about that. So, I like good and massive challenges, though. So don't label me was birthed, and um, let me move over here so I can see this. Um, this was birthed because as a dyslexic, I see the world kind of from way up here. And what that means is I take every situation that I encounter and I, I think about it like this. So I like things that make pictures in our heads. Can we read this together? When a flower doesn't bloom, you fix the environment in which it grows not the flower. So you reading with me helps me feel more confident. So I'm being vulnerable in telling you reading out loud makes me sweat. Anybody here have, like, had that? Okay, like, reading out loud can be scary. But what I'll tell you is there's nothing wrong with me as a flower. I just need to be in places where the soil is highly nourished. Do you know what I mean? Sometimes we just look at the thing, but I like to look deeper. So this is how I look at the world. Now, Megan and Dave, I'm so happy to work with them. Um, their academic experiences were pretty extraordinary. They're, they're very bright. Um, but this was my academic experience. So like, yeah, yeah, like I was like friends with all these people. This might look like a group of friends you're friends with, right? Because you guys know like the bird who's asked to do something is gonna be fine. So let's read what's in the talk level together. For a fair selection, Everybody has to take the same exam. Please climb to that tree. Now you know who's going to be okay. To yell out, who's going to be fine to climb the tree? Thank you, children. Everyone else who's going to be fine. The monkey. The monkey's going to be fine. Like ha ha, ha baby, baby, I'm up, right? 
the bird doesn't even have to climb, right? The seal, I don't know, like, how's that going to go? The penguin, I don't know how that's going to go either. I would love to be the elephant and knock the tree down, because <laughs> I don't have to, like, climb it, I knock it down, right? <laughs> but straight up, I'm the goldfish. Every day, I'm the goldfish. I can't even breathe out of water. So when you put in front of me to do the thing you're asking everybody else to do that they can do, I cannot do it. This is my, this, this is the perfect description of my academic experience. Does anyone relate? I'm saying it. Sometimes that stuff doesn't work for everybody. All right, let's read this together if you can see it. It's a quote by Albert Einstein, an also fellow dyslexic, brilliant. <laughs> everybody is a genius, but if you judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree, it will live its whole life believing that it is stupid. I'm not dumb. I'm not stupid. Actually, I got to talk at TED. Anybody heard of TED Talks? How fun is that? They gave me eight minutes to tell my story. Eight minutes. <laughs> I'm a talker. I need like 40 bucks. Okay, so I got on the stage and I actually accomplished this goal because I practiced, right? And I love mastering something. And I didn't even know I'm a public speaker until I got up there and I'm like, dang, girl, you can talk. Right? I had an amazing coach. Can everyone say thank you? This is Jason, he's smiling. Raise your hand, Jason, help me, he's my coach. So he was like, you, you can do this, and, and you have to have one person who believes in you, right? So I got on that stage and I'm like, I can do this. So I'm gonna do this real quick, right now, ready? This is my TED talk. Welcome to TEDx, Indianapolis. I love stickers. Anybody here love stickers? Yay, yay to that guy who was like, woo! Okay, but you all love stickers, just some of you aren't feeling brave. You don't want to take a risk. Like, you, you don't want everyone to know that you really still love stickers. But I love stickers. I carry this around like a kid. My parents can, you know, they can say that. Yes, I carry this around like a treasure box, this sticker book. It was kind of like the thing that you knew that if someone gave you a sticker, it validated you somehow. Like, you left the dentist, you still had a cavity, they gave you a sticker. <laughs> You're like, dang, thanks. Right? I love stickers. I do. I love them to this day. I still do. Um, I moved when I was seven from Tennessee to Indiana, and it was first grade. I walked in, like, first day, walked in. And I don't know anyone, but I was really confident. My parents had said a lot of cool things to me, like, you are so beautiful. You're so amazing. You're so smart. And so I walk in with my shoulders back, and like, what up? First grade. I'm beautiful. I'm amazing. I'm smart. I have this confidence about me. Oh. I know. It's so cute. Yeah, that's me. And first grade. And then she said, you know, get your books, sit down, it's reading time. And I found a little extra special spot because I was a new kid under the teacher's desk and I was like turning the pages. And I was watching all you guys, but you were turning the pages faster, so I just turned the pages with you because honestly the words meant nothing to me. Nothing at all. And I was like, hmm, something is different about me I already know. Because everything in the classroom began to make strings of pictures in my mind and it was magical. But like this book meant nothing to me. I got sat down in meetings with my parents and the people in the school and they'd be like talking about me, not to me. Has that ever happened to you? That sucks. They were saying things like, you know, like, I don't know, she's slow, she's really slow, maybe she's delayed or something, like she's dumb, I don't know, maybe. You know, there's this room down the hall, the special education room, special education room, and like, one teacher in fourth grade just got so frustrated with how articulate I sounded, but how I couldn't write a complete sentence. She was like, what are you, retarded? And my neck was like crawling with this red, like, irritation rash. And I was like, dang, you're mad. Why are you so mad? Uh, that's the best sentence I got. And that took me like two hours. See, people just didn't understand. I'm just different. But very quickly, I got a lot of like deep wisdom going on at a very young age. And even though I didn't know Maya Angelou, this quote sums it up. And we're going to read it together. I've learned that people will forget what you said. People will forget what you did. But people will never forget how you made them feel. Has anyone just ever been talking to you and you're like, man, they think I'm stupid? And they don't say you're stupid, but they make you feel small. It's not okay for people to do, but it happens. And this is kind of like why I became a creative. It was about second grade and I'm like, I'm a creative problem solver. They obviously tell me there's a problem, so boom, I'm gonna solve it. I feel pretty, uh, 
pretty much like that was a risk I had to take. You know, everybody around me was getting stickers on the top of their papers, and I wasn't, so I just took the words off their papers and put them on mine. How did that go? I got a sticker on the top of my paper. And it said, keep up the good work. I was like, okay. I mean, as a third grader, that's just like the best I got. I just solved the world's problems. Now nobody's yelling at me. Nobody's frustrated with me. No one's making me feel small. Now, fast forward to the end of high school. It's time to sit down with the guidance counselor and talk about what I'm gonna do, right? And how to speech planned. I like how to cape, and I was a superhero. I was gonna tell her I was gonna make the world a better place, and I was gonna serve the unwanted and the unloved. I was gonna, I was gonna make the world a better place. I had so many plans. And I walked in the office, and she said this. Hey, Holly, sit down. I've got all your papers, your tests, and you're really not college material. But you seem artsy, maybe you wanna cut hair. Realistic. That had never entered my mind to be. Superheroes aren't realistic, they fly. And I was planning to fly. I dismissed her words. I left, went to college, graduated on the dean's list with honors and awards. What? <laughs> now, it's all because you go back to that voice, just like Dave's teacher in high school, and you go back, my dad would say this all the time. He'd be like, you know what, you can do anything. You can do anything. And by anything, he meant anything. He wasn't like being selective or asking me to be realistic. And what I want to tell you is don't be realistic. Wake up one morning and say, I'd like to encourage people for a living. That sounds neat. Don't be realistic. It's not helpful. I, uh, I wasn't the traditional type teacher, but I did go on to start teaching in classrooms. And I, again, felt like it was my, my goal to help the unloved or unserved or unwanted feel loved, wanted valuable, right? And I started teaching, and it was really, really fun. And um, I would tell these kids that, like, I had trouble reading, like, so much trouble reading, I've never read a book. And they're like, whoa, me neither. I'm like, cool, I get you. But, you know, I am a published author, so that's kind of interesting, right? So this is our book. Um, Dave and I read this book, and it's about what, you might ask? Stickers. Heck yeah, say it, stickers. <laughs> <laughs> that's right, there are stickers in the back of this book. It's super cool. We celebrated an art form that no one was documenting. People are putting stickers all over the world, tiny, tiny pieces of art because graffiti takes too long and you get caught and go to jail, you know. Graphic designers, all the spray painting people became graphic designers. It's so cool. Um, and they made small adhesive art. So at this point, whenever I have like mastery of something, I want a new challenge. And I told you, I started like thinking I should work with juvenile offenders. I showed up at an interview for a job I did not want to explain to them the job I wanted that I don't, didn't think existed. I said, I'd like to work with juvenile offenders. I'd like to use art as a gateway, like therapeutic art techniques. And he's like, you don't want this job? I was like, no, 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 just listen. <laughs> yeah. Actually, now he's like a really dear friend of ours. He's our fiscal sponsor, Art with the Heart. His name's Andrew Lee. Super cool guy. That was Andrew, yeah. So, um, so actually, um, he landed me two weeks later with 25 juvenile offenders in a classroom. And I walked in going, now what do I do? I didn't really have a plan. I knew my plan was to listen and learn their needs. So what do you do when you don't know what to do? You notice they all have house arrest bans. Oh, will you give me one of these stickers? Yeah. So Autumn's gonna hand these out as you guys exit. Anybody have one of these? What's it say? Can you see it says you are beautiful. So I, I thought my spatial reasoning is excellent. Can't read, but I knew these would fit on these perfectly and I was right. So, like, lined up, 25, grilled out, tattooed face, thugged out, rapping, black tap. I put these on their little, little house arrest bands. <laughs> yeah, I did. I didn't know if you could do that or not, but I did. And I got, like, a hundred of them before I got the letter. <laughs> That's okay. That's okay. Rules never meant much to me. So... Um, what I did is after giving them these stickers, I thought, you know, I'm going to dig a little, a little deeper, and this is where don't label me comes in. I thought I love stickers so much, and I felt like people had labeled my soul with stupid, slow, retarded, dumb, and these carried on me, unbeknownst to me, were barriers to my success. They were stickers on my soul's labels that people had tried to define me as, and let me just tell you, people cannot define who you are, and right now, actually, in the past 
year. I've done this with over 8,000 people, this don't label me experience. I've asked people to identify those labels that people have unfairly placed on them, because it's not my juvenile offenders, it's everybody in the whole wide world. You carry labels that are barriers to your success. You carry labels that stop you from taking risks because you have fear because someone told you a lie somewhere and you believed it. I don't have time to do this exercise with you today, but what I will ask you is to really ask yourself what you are carrying. Because it is not anyone's right to define who you are. You choose that for yourself so you can be the best person you are. People write down the craziest things, and I have a box full of shredded labels that people have gone through this exercise and been brave with me, and shredded the labels that people have unfairly put on them, and then we celebrate who they really are. Now, this is everybody. I've gotten to do this with the Department of Justice. What? Aren't they like superheroes? No, they're like people in suits and stuff. But, but I've done this with the entire staff of Arsenal Tech High School. Why? Because if you identify the things in you that people have labeled unfairly to you, then you have compassion for others. And that's where we gotta get. Now, after you shred these and ask yourself who you truly are, who you were gifted to be, then, then, then you can do whatever you want. Because then you are empowered. You are no longer a victim of these things. And I would like to just also say that we can be pretty mean to ourselves. Don't do that. Like, what good is that for you to be like, good morning, ugh, look at this. You are beautiful to me, and I hope you know that. After shredding labels and asking yourself this, this question of what labels are you carrying, I'm going to ask you to consider this. So we're gonna read this together. All right, so we're gonna read this together because this is really an important part of the process. I never knew, I never knew how strong I was until I had to forgive someone who wasn't sorry and accept an apology I never received. Thanks. I really need you to know who you are. That's what the Department of Public Words is. These words have so much power over you that I need you to go to that place where you're celebrating those gifts that only you have. Because right now, some of you are sitting in a place and you haven't stood up and walked out of that doctor or orientation and walked to the thing you are supposed to be doing. And the most good I can do right now is to get you guys to go where that place is because you are the only person that can do that thing you're thinking of. You are the only one that is gifted to be able to do that thing. And so you're like in this place, I gotta pay off my loans, I gotta do this thing. But no, like the world is waiting for you to stop and just be brave and take a risk and go do that thing you're supposed to be doing. That's the best thing that could happen. That's like the main goal of me standing here. It's to get you to move from here to here because you're supposed to be here. It's scary. But it's so worth it. These two guys I had to move from ducked out prison, stealing a 52 inch TV running, like how far are you gonna get? <laughs> to one of them dealing cocaine in one of the biggest high schools here in our city. I had to move them from being labeled crim criminals to like graduates and extraordinary humans that I knew and believed they could be. These are two of my babies. I didn't birth them, but I deeply love them. And they had to move from the labels of criminal to the labels of successful. Okay, there's a voice that we all have. And I don't know, it sounds different when I talk to people. Where that voice comes from, I don't know where it comes from for you, where you hear that thing that you know you should do. You guys want to talk about it's like a conscience or a voice. Whenever I know I'm to do something, it's like right about here I feel it. So we were driving on 10th Street. Anybody know 10th Street? Ooh, good. I love it. We drive on it every day. It's so active. <laughs> Right at 10th and Rule, like, yeah, we know Sally, and like, she's been there a while, she's got a history there, and then like, there's a lot of drug deals and weed at Pope's Run, and anybody been there, it's really good, Pope's Run, you should go, it's an awesome little place there. Right at 10th and Rule, um, I felt like we should pull over and stop the car, so I say to Dave, oh my gosh, we gotta paint the top of that building, he's like, right now? I was like, yeah, like, right now? He's like, huh, okay. 
He's cool. He's really cool. Um, I said, like, I need you to run and get a green gallon of paint. He's like, right now? And I was like, yes, right now. He's like, oh, remember that part where we're not vandals, where we're artists and we get paid to do our work? You need to get permission to remember that part. I was like, oh, yeah, right, right, right. No, really. Okay, so I went into the building and Little Green Bean Boutique is there and I talked to the owner. I said, you know what? I'd like to paint You Are Beautiful on the top of your building. I feel it. I feel like it's like really urgent, like right now. She's like, okay, well, actually, the building owner's in the bathroom if you want to wait. I was like, oh, yeah. So he comes out, I'm like, hi, my name's Holly. I'd like to paint on your building. He's like, cool, that's great. When? And I was like, now. <laughs> okay. I said, so can I help? Yes, I would love help. So Dave ran to get the green gallon of paint, comes back, we climb up on this wall, and there we paint. There we paint. There it is. Can you guys see it's like down here? Has anybody seen this one at 10th and Roll? Okay. So we painted three hours later. It said, you are beautiful. We went on with our life. I don't know why. It was that day. It had to be that day. Um, two weeks later, we were at a block party, and my daughter was playing basketball. We're not huge athletes, but we try. And um, she was bouncing and doing, and I saw a ball of some sort, and then I saw like a bend in her arm, like this, in an area there shouldn't be a bend in the arm. She's just like, real cool. She walks up, she's like, hey mom, I think I broke my arm. <laughs> so I'm like sweating, and like, I feel like my organs fell out, and like, oh my gosh. <sighs> okay, she's like, it's okay, mom. I'm like, Dang. Okay, so they said it without any drugs. She is like a superhero. Honestly, if you want to chat with her, she's at our merch table. We have cool shirts and stuff. She is the most, she is sunshine. Around people, this girl makes me feel like she could really bring a smile to the like most hardened person. And I'm delighted to have her as my daughter. So she fell, broke her arm, and went to the hospital. She's not crying ever until she realizes it's her right arm and she's an artist. She can't draw. So now she's crying because she's an artist. She can't draw. Like, we have priorities. I was like, babe, what can I do? How can I help? She said, can I get one of those cake pops? <laughs> You're all laughing because you know it's an overpriced piece of cake on a stick at the Starbucks. <laughs> I always say no. I was like, okay, I'll get you one. We walk in, and we walk in, I'm greeted by this guy. And he smiled, similar to how Sky smiles, like sunshine. I was like, whoa, you just made me smile, guy. Like, I was feeling pretty heavy. I got this girl, she's sad. And I was like, hi. Hello, ma'am. I noticed his leg's broken. And I'm like, Sky, you guys should chit chat about, you know, how cat things go. If anyone's had a cat, it smells, it itches, it sucks. So they're chatting about cats and getting the overpriced cake pop. And I come back over and they're just chatting it up. And I was like, oh no, his other leg was amputated. And it had one of the things, the metal, that... So I could see that one of his legs was amputated, one of them was broken, and I was like, oh, dude. And so I did what I, what I always do, and I, uh, I got in my purse, and I got him a You Are Beautiful sticker. I mean, how can you really help? I mean, that's just a bad day, but he was smiling. I handed him this, I said, man, I hope you have a great day. Thanks for talking to my daughter. I hand it to him and he goes, tenth and rule, 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 tenth and rule. And I was like, tenth and rule? <laughs> he said, yeah. And he got so in his face and he goes, yeah. I was getting off the bus and I had just put a cast on this thing and, and my other one's amputated and I looked up and it was like a message from heaven. He said, I was walking to end my life that day because it was too much. But I was like, you know what, man? I, I am beautiful. I've got purpose. I can do this. And he walked home. And he's still an awesome pastor in the East Side. You see, I don't know all the stories. But what I know is that voice inside of you that tells you to do that thing, man. Do that thing, like, right now. Because honestly, the timing, I lined it up, man. It was important. It was that day. And I don't know what you're supposed to be doing, but I know if you are not doing that right now, you have to jump. Like divergent, like you don't know where you're gonna land, but just jump. Because we jumped and we 
love our lives. And I want everyone to love their lives. And I want you to wake up smiling because what you're going to do today is going to be so fantastic. And you know it. So I love you guys very much. And I am so thankful you came today. And there's a purpose in that. And I hope that you are encouraged. I hope that you are moved to a place where you can jump. Because that's really why we came today. You have to know that you are awesome. And once you know that, anything is possible. Anything at all. So don't forget how much I love you. Don't forget that we have your beautiful shirts. Megan can hand them up. So if you, it says, don't forget your beautiful inside and out on the inside. And these are just fresh printed. The first 15 that have been printed. And if someone will stand up and tell me why they're beautiful, you get this shirt. Oh, you want to. <laughs> no, do it. One of you. Be brave. Jump. Take a risk. Come up here. Yeah! Come up here. I'm Stephen, and I'm giving and loving. She's giving and loving, so tell her. Oh, but it's, I'm giving and loving the people out of me. So she is back to the So awesome. And then I want someone who stands up who hates Comic Sans the most. Yes! All right. Um, I, can't, I couldn't get all the logos on here. These are all the people that support and love us, that we partner with and help give us funds. Um, I love you guys so much. And when I talked about exposure bucks, I didn't mean that you couldn't donate your skills to us because donating is different than exposure bucks. It's like, it's like hearts and flowers and unicorn bucks. And so like, if anyone has skills that they think they could bring to the table and help us do what we do, we are three strong. But honestly, we could grow and become so much more. So thank you so much for listening, and I love you guys very much.